Today's episode is about the first Navy pilot in World War II to become an ace. His name? Butch O'Hare. Today we're going to tell a story that's not known by most. How he teamed up with the TBM Avenger and how they together helped innovate night fighting. And then with our TBM, which is still lost in the White Mountains of Arizona, we're going to jump in the cockpit and do a flight simulation of the actual last few minutes of the doomed flight. Our story starts out with the 13-year-old Edward O'Hare. And he was a little bit of trouble as a boy, so his dad put him in the Western Academy Military School. And there, from eighth grade all the way through high school, he thrived. From there, he would go on to the Naval Academy, where he would graduate in 1937. This is where he got his nickname, Butch. By the time Butch had finished his pilot training and earned his wings, war was already raging in Europe. He was assigned to the USS Saratoga, and he worked under the tutelage of the famous Jimmy Thatch. Thatch took a keen eye to Butch as he saw him as a standout. Butch just seemed to have an amazing combination of mental, physical, and personal skills as a pilot. It looked like he really had found his calling. It's February 20th, 1942, and things are really heating up. Butch is aboard the USS Lexington with Jimmy Thatch. The Lexington's radar picks up enemy bombers only 12 miles away and closing. There's only two Wildcats in position to defend the carriers in the fleet. Butch and his wingman, and his wingman's guns jam. Well, with Butch's accurate deflection shooting, he makes three passes and takes out five enemy bombers. And the entire battle was on stage for all of the ships below. The entire fleet of carriers, cruisers, destroyers, thousands of sailors were looking up cheering wildly. And here is the actual film of Command Pilot Warren Officer Chuzo Watanabe trying to crash into the Lexington but fatally crashes down into the sea. Well, it was back to the States and no less than a Medal of Honor for Butch O'Hare, presented by the President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt. And then off to the parades, selling war bonds, and then back to business. This was the USS Enterprise, the Big E as she was known, and it was November 1943. She was the last of the original carriers, but they couldn't sink her. But now there were new tactics at hand, night flying. Japanese bombers were harassing the fleet just about every night, but new tactics were being developed which included the TBF Avenger. The Avenger was a newer torpedo bomber and it had a crew of three. This airplane was to play a key role in the night fighting techniques that were being developed. This is a picture of John Phillips. He was commander of VT-6, at first in the Yorktown and then finally on the Enterprise. His group did much of the pioneering in night attacks for Com Air Pack. John was a little bit understated and quiet, but he carried a big stick as he was one of the top Avenger pilots in the Navy. It was in April of 1942 that the Navy started experimenting with night attacks, starting with Corsairs from land bases. It was called Project Argus, later to be called AFIRM. Well, remember this guy? From our last episode, Frank Whitaker. He was the guy who was doing some of the early developments on radar inside the TBM Avengers. He was the guy that would beg, borrow, or steal to make it happen. And it was early in 1943 that he was doing all this to contribute to the progress. The 
Japanese pressed on with their attacks night after night after night. What they would do is they would send in snoopers in the evening, seaplanes or other reconnaissance planes, and they'd report back. And then the bombers would be sent out in the pitch black to try to find the fleet. Their mainstay was the Mitsubishi G4M, nicknamed Betty, Japanese attack bomber. Gun armaments included one 20mm cannon in the tail and the waist and nose gunners at 7.7mm. Nicknamed Black Panthers with bat teams, bring in the TBF Avenger with John Phillips. Once it was dark, he got an early start and he wasted no time in shooting two Betty bombers down. But now the main mission was forming. John was just waiting for his two F6F Hellcats to come in. Of course, one of the Hellcats was piloted by Butch O'Hare and the other ensign Andy Scon, his wingman. Together they slowly closed the distance and then they saw the recognition lights from the TBF. As they slowly closed the distance, the machine gunner of the Avenger, Alvin Kernan on his 50 caliber, almost shot them, did not recognize them until he finally saw the recognition lights come on. And as they traded their signals, slowly out of the darkness, way up above, there was an intruder. As it turned out, it was another Betty bomber sneaking up on them. Alvin Kernan and the turret saw it. He was radioing for permission to shoot. There was confusion, so he opened up. But the nose gunner on the Betty bomber had already taken aim on Butch's plane and started to let loose. Butch's plane was hit, possibly in the crossfire. No one will ever know but it was hit and it was going down. TBF turret gunner Kernan would later reflect, as the Hellcat dropped out of view, it seemed to release something that floated down, almost vertically at a speed too slow for anything, anything but a parachute, something whitish gray, it appeared below, perhaps a parachute or, more likely, the splash of the plane plunging into the sea. Sadly, the next day and the following days, many searches would be sent out to look for Butch, but he was never found. Here are a couple of images of the 1945 TBM-3 Avenger, the Avenger that was lost in the White Mountains of Eastern Arizona two years ago and is still missing. We're going to look at a flight simulation of the last minutes, but first a couple of videos of one of its last stops in Bakersfield, California. I had come from the north the day before and landed here to avoid deteriorating weather in the Los Angeles area. Today was a beautiful VFR day, so off to Torrance it was. But before leaving the pattern, I did a low pass for some of my friends there. This would be the last time I would ever do a low pass in this airplane.
This is a crude flight simulation on the final minutes of the doomed flight. And there, as the catastrophic engine failure happened, the one thing you won't note from this simulation is that the engine was shaking so hard it it felt like it was going to come off. And, of course, there was blinding smoke, and I'm checking the dials. But one thing I did notice coming in here it was starting to descend. I had pulled the power back to maybe 30%, just guessing. Um, and this marsh to the right, I was considering a right downwind. And um, knowing that uh, there was nowhere to land, uh, and, and I had already done my what-ifs, I gave Kenny the arm signal to bail out. I had my hand out the right window. We couldn't talk on the radio at that point. And uh, I had looked back and saw he was gone. But what I didn't know, he was still, he was still actually hanging on. So as I continued along, I was trying to, uh, I looked out the right window. I said, I'm going to really have to do this. Um, And what I did is I pulled the airplane up to the right to try to lessen the Gs. I guess that's when Kenny said he let go. And now I'm climbing out of the cockpit, struggling to get out because I was pinned against the canopy from the slipstream. It was incredible. And about here, I'm free. I closed my eyes went into a cannonball, missed the tail, thank God, and free fell. I was right above the trees. The chute opened, and uh, here you can see the plane is lighter by 500 pounds, skimming along. It's not losing a lot of altitude in this simulation. That would be a a worst case that it's, it's not losing. And at this point, I'm already in the trees. I've already hit the ground, and uh, the simulator just shows... Uh, losing altitude, but not that much. Um, I've sped this whole thing up uh, a little bit, and then it crashes into this ridge right here, which is the second or third ridge from the Aspen Butte. So as you look at uh, a real image of the actual area, this image is taken from the top of Mount Baldy looking out that way. You can see how dense the forest is. You can actually see in the distance those ridges. And uh, it's there where the plane probably is, of course, right now, being winter, buried under many feet of snow. 